Sanborn, are you blessed? Hey, you don't sound convincing. Are you blessed this morning? Yeah, that's a little better. That's a little better. May I invite you to read with me from the 43rd chapter of Genesis. Genesis chapter 43. Yes. And we are reflecting on the first 10 verses. Genesis chapter 43. We are reflecting on the first 10 verses. Are we there? Yes. Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt that their father said to them, go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, the man solemnly warned us, saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, Repeating it for the second time. You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, why did you deal so wrongly with me? As to tell the man whether you had still another brother. But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family saying, is your brother still alive? Have you another brother? Or is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words. Could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. Both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you as set, set him before, before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Maybe you can pause for a word of prayer. Gracious, kind and lovely Father, we want to thank you this day. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. We pray that you may be present as we are absent. To the glory of your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want us to speak shortly on a theme, a call to maturity. A call to maturity. A call to mature. You see, you see sometime um, we need to grow up. <laughs> we need to grow up. We, we, need, we need to show signs that we are no more longer as young as we were. And, and we grow up. One person puts it differently. He says, when he defines maturity, he says, maturity has nothing to do with understanding big terminology. It has all to do when we begin to understand small things. Ah. Hey, 
Eh? You understand that? Yeah. Maturity has nothing to do with us saying big words, reciting big terms. Maturity begins when we start to understand small things. Small things. You see, I want us to look at three things from this text and then we'll be done. Then we'll be done. I'm telling you, we'll be done in three hours. <laughs> we'll be done in three hours. That's how much I like short sermons. Three hours time, we'll, we'll be done. Three hours time, we'll be done. You see, in this chapter, chapter 43, it's a conversation between Judah, who is Israel's fourth son and his father. He comes to speak to his father after his brother had made an attempt in the previous chapter, chapter 42, and failed his elder brother. And his elder brother's name is Reuben. Reuben calls Israel and he bargains with him. He wanted him to release Benjamin, the young lad, that is Israel's last son. Release him so that we may take him with back to Egypt. Because we met a man in Egypt. We don't know the man. But the man asked if we still have a father and a brother. And we told him that we have a brother by the name of Benjamin. And so he said, go back, fetch that one, come back here, and I will release this other one, Simeon, whom he had kept until they bring back Benjamin. You see, the problem is that they could not identify Joseph, but he identified them very well. Ah. Uh, because in this life, it is easier to do silly things and forget. Yes. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. They mistreated their own brother and they forgot about him. Yeah. When he had disappeared from their eyes, they thought, it's finished. He's gone. We'll never see him. We'll never meet him. We sold him to strangers. But they did not know the law of karma. Ah. Listen, at some point, the things we do when we are at our lowest point ah, will find us. Yeah. They have a way of catching up with us. And so, when they had gone to Egypt to buy food, Joseph kept Simeon. He instructed them to go back home and return with Benjamin. Then he will return Simeon. So in chapter 42, um, Reuben bargains with Israel, but Israel said, says, you know what? I left my son, my favorite son, into your hands, and you let me down. I am not about to release another. So he says, no dice. I'm not giving you Benjamin. It doesn't happen. Huh? Mm -hmm. So chapter 43, it is now a conversation between Israel, that's Jacob, and Judah this time, the fourth son. The fourth son. So in verse 3, he is mentioned by name. In verse 3, he is mentioned by name. But you see, those who are readers of the Bible would already know a lot about Judah than they will about Reuben. Ah. Mm. Eh? Okay. Man. Because the Bible, when it speaks about Judah, it will say, he is 
the one, when they wanted to kill Joseph, he's the one who took them out and said, let us rather sell him. Let's sell him. So they sold him. In fact, in fact, he said, no, let's dig up a hole and throw him there. Let's not kill him. So they dug up a hole and they threw him down there. Fortunately, there were strangers who were passing by. He's the one again who said, let's rescue him out of that semi-grave and sell him. They are selling their own brother. But as they were selling him, he said, let's take his jacket. So they keep the jacket and sell the brother. Uh -huh. They have an interest in his possessions, but not in him as a person. They are not interested in their brother. They are interested in what their brother possesses. So they keep the jacket and they lose a brother. <laughs> they keep the, the jacket and they lose the brother. They lose the brother. He disappears from their eyes and they are not worried. Judah again is the one who formulates an alibi and he says, let's go back home and we will tell our father that your son was devoured by wild animals. It's Judah. He's selfish. He thinks only for himself and not for others. But he was too ashamed as they were traveling back home with this alibi. He was too ashamed to go back and face his father. And so in chapter 38, he takes a detour and he marries an unbeliever. Ah. That's Judah for you. That's Judah for you. And he was blessed with three sons. Two of them died because they were playing with bullets. They played with bullets when they were supposed to shoot. They started spraying all over and God was angry at them. And they died. It's in chapter 38. Go and read it. Ah. You don't need to play with bullets. You will need them during the time of war. And you will be found to be wanting. So God was angry at the two brothers and they died. The Bible says in the same chapter, chapter 38, the selfish Judah, after the death of his, of his wife, then he decided to revive and resuscitate his old hobby of hunting. And so as he was going to a hunting um, trip, his daughter-in-law heard about it and she posed as an executive, a domestic executive. Ah. She posed as a domestic executive but covered her face. She showed her thighs and covered her face. Ah. And Judah, who was to pass by, he saw the thighs and not the face, and he started a discussion with this lady. May I spend a night with you? He did not realize that this was, in fact, his daughter-in-law. Spend a night with me. And the lady said, nothing for Mahala. Imal Pambil in the tomb. And he says, look, I don't have money now. But I'm a rich man. I have lots of money. I will give it to you in the morning. Instead, then the daughter-in-law said, give me something as a deposit. Ah. He surrendered his stuff and his arrow as an a deposit for the service rendered that night. Early in the morning, 
He left the place and rushed back home. When they rose up that morning, Judah was at home, rising up with the rest, as if he had spent the night there. Later, he then gets a coat, takes a journey, go back to that spot, looks for this lady, but the lady was nowhere to be found. He inquires around, have you ever seen such and such a lady? And they said, we don't know her. We don't know her. Ah. Fast forward, six months thereafter, the lady is pregnant. Ah. With twins. With twins. And Judah is judgmental. Ah. The judgmental Judah says, it's chapter 38, it's in chapter 38. Judgmental Judah says, this lady has brought disgrace to our family. And so according to the tradition of the day, he was supposed, she was supposed to be picked by giants. They will take her to some mountain. Then they will burn her brow so that it may be a sign that she brought a disgrace to his family. And the lady cooperated. But when they were just about to leave, the lady says, before we leave, she's talking to the giants. Please take this stuff, the rod, and the arrow. Go and ask my father-in-law, whose property is this? Ah. Listen, it is easier to have many words when you think that you are guilty, but no one knows. Ah. Hey. So Judah was shown a spear and a rod and he got ashamed. The expedition was aborted. He then gave an instruction leave that lady alone. Towards the end of chapter 38, that lady gave birth to two boys. One who was light in complexion, whose name was Zera. Another was Perez. They were twins. They were twins. Perez means breakthrough. And just when Tama was about to give birth, the first one came out, but he showed a hand and the midwife said, this is not how a baby is born. It's either he comes through his legs or through his head and not. Uh -huh. And so she tied a red um, or a scarlet something on his finger. On, on, his, uh, on his hand and pushed it back. The other came out. That's why his name is called Perez. You read Matthew chapter 1 verse 3. You then discover that Perez is an ancestor of Jesus. Jesus was to be born uh, from a history of incest between a father-in-law and his daughter-in-law. Ah. Are you saying you are corrupt in your life or you've reached a point of no return? I am telling you, there is no point that the blood of Jesus cannot reach. Even at that worst point, it reaches out. Ah. Hallelujah. That is Judah for you. That is Judah. So when we read chapter 43, and we see a discussion between Judah and his father. 
then we already know that we are speaking about a selfish and self-centered young man that thinks only for himself and no one else. Huh? But beginning from verse 3 to verse 6, we are seeing a change in his life. Ah, He's making a plea to his father. And what is his plea? His plea this time is, if we do not go, one family will perish of hunger. He says, if we do not go back to Simeon is lost forever. Ah. If we do not go free, our own children will die of hunger. What do we see this time around? We are seeing that God is using life's practical events to change our attitude and our characters. We should never despise events around our lives. Sometimes they are not pleasant at all. But listen, even unpleasant circumstances, God is able to use them to our favor. So when things go wrong, don't throw your hands on the air and say, God is silent and I am dying alone. Listen, he is not silent. He is very active, even in his silence. Because he has an intention of using the very event to benefit you and not him. Ah. Yeah? Can you say that? So, yes, it's true that in our lives, corporately as families, or individuals, or as a church, or as a nation, or as the world, that things are not rosy after all. And God seemed to be so quiet and silent. Let me tell you, he's using the very events uh, to our own benefit. That's why we need to open our eyes and open our ears and shush. Uh -huh. We need to shush, open our ears and open our eyes and see what God is doing for us as he uses even our own life's events. Verses 7 to verse 10. Then Judah is making a pledge. And his pledge, he says, I want to stand as short by putting my neck on the block that we will return not only with this one, but also with the other one. Hey, listen. You only need to have read the book of Genesis up to this point for you not to understand what God is doing in the life of Judah. Because in chapter 44, Judah is seen now in the company of Joseph that they sold, who is now an official in Egypt. We are seeing Judah pleading on behalf of the whole group. Ah. He is taking responsibility for the whole group and he says, I am guilty as charge because I'm the one that sold you. I'm the one that sold you. Listen, you need to read the scriptures further to understand that God wanted to use this event to mature Judah because God knew that kings will only come from his tribe and not from Reuben, the firstborn son. Uh, kings only come from the fourthborn son and not the first 
born son. Why? Because this one was matured to handle leadership. Leadership is not for kids. It's not for children. It's not for people who are childish. Ah. And for you to grow, I am saying God uses life's events to grow you. I don't know what we are going through. But one thing I know is that your life's events do not leave an eye of the Lord unnoticed. And he is using those very events to benefit you and mature you so that you can be a better person. Hey, let's pray. Let's pray. Gonna light up the whole wide world. Gonna let it shine.